okay this here is russia this here is the russian far east and this here is a jewish autonomous oblast with the main city of Bidabijan. and that's why i am now how did this jewish autonomous region came to be and was it a homeland for the jews or more a place of exile let's find out in Tsarist Russia, there were living many Jews, and unfortunately for them, there was widespread anti-Semitism. Even the Tsars themselves, they didn't like the Jews, and did little to nothing to stop anti-Jewish programs that happened in Tsar Russia throughout the decades. Now, under Catherine the Great, there was a pale of settlement in Western Russia, where the Jews basically had to live, but there were also living many non-Jews there. Flash forward to the end of the 1920s, Russia was no more, it was now the Soviet Union. Now often people call Soviet Union Russia, but this isn't correct because the Soviet Union consisted of many of these Soviet socialist republics that were inhabited by Belarusians, Ukrainians, Kazakhs, Uzbeks and so on and so forth. Now it has to be said that the Russian Soviet Republic was the biggest and also the Russians were in charge but still. And there were also Jewish people living in the Soviet Union. And the Jews they had their own language, Yiddish, and they had their own culture and customs, yet they did not have their own historical territory. But according to the Soviets, everything is makeable. So why not make a Jewish territory? And if you're the Soviet Union, you look to the east. There was an area near the border of China that was kind of contested with the Chinese authorities and they wanted to shore that up by moving millions and millions of Jews there. Now first the Soviet authorities they sent a commission to investigate whether this area would be good to inhabit. Now the commission came back and the advice was very negative because most of the area consisted of swamps and rocks, very bad for agriculture, not to mention the insects in the summer that would eat all the harvest. So the advice was negative. But like I said, in the Soviet Union, everything is makeable. So despite the fact that the advice was negative, the Soviets did it anyway. So a year after the mission was undertaken, it was now 1929, the first Jews migrated to this area. Okay, now Jews, they used to be fairly rich because they conducted private trade. Thing was, the Soviets, they outlawed private trade. So therefore, many of the Jews in Western Russia were now very impoverished. And they decided to take their chances. They were promised by housing and also starting kits, cattle and agricultural tools to get the thing going. However, as they arrived here, they discovered that many of these promises weren't materialized. So those who could afford it, they just left. We're talking about 50% or so. Some ran away. And others, they tried to make the best of it. And they took part in the collective farms. Now some of these Jewish state farms were actually financed by American money. Some American and Argentine Jews moved to this area. Now, as for the Jewish elite, they loved it because they could now freely practice their Yiddish culture and language without being discriminated. In 1934, this area officially became the Jewish Autonomous Oblast and can never be considered the first Jewish state because it was founded 14 years prior to the state of Israel. However, do notice that Moscow was in charge at all time. And that is what we see after 1934 because the joy of the Jewish intellectual elite was short-lived. Because then, the Great Purge started. Many people on the orders of Stalin were arrested, tried and executed or sent to the Gulag. And the same happened to the Jewish intellectual elite. Under this repression, the Bidabijan elite was decimated and most of the Yiddish culture was abolished. Instead of dreaming of flourishing Yiddish culture in the Russian Far East, it was now all about survival. Now this continued all the way until the end of the Second World War. Now after the Second World War was over, more Jews came to this area. 
These were Belarusian and Ukrainian Jews that had survived the onslaught of the Nazis by fleeing eastward. And after the war was over, they wanted to return to their houses. But their houses were either destroyed or now inhabited by ethnic Belarusians and Ukrainians. And the local Belarusian and Ukrainian authorities, they were not waiting for other conflicts to break out. So these Jews were kindly but urgently requested to move to the Russian Far East and thus they arrived here in Bidibijan and what we see here is that after this a reflourishing of the Jewish culture took place. However also this was short-lived because in the last years of Stalin's reign he undertook anti-Jewish measures. The leaders of the Jewish anti-fascist committees who played a prominent role in World War II in the fight against Nazism were tried and executed. And then there was also the doctor's plot where Stalin had his paranoia idea that Jewish doctors conspired against him. The entire cultural elite of Biderbijan was arrested and charged with nationalism. Many of them disappeared behind bars for many years. Also, Jidi's books became forbidden and at some point the local authorities went to the Jewish library they got out the Jewish books and burned them in public where does this remind you of according to Russian Jewish historian Masha Geshen five years after the end of the Second World War the Sholem Alechaim library of the Jewish autonomous region staged a book burning in its courtyard to destroy every Yiddish language book that had been found in the region. After this, Jewish culture went underground. People were afraid of speaking Yiddish in public and even in their homes. Stalin died in 1953, and with that, the repressions of Jewish culture came to an end. However, Jewish culture would never flourish. And when in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, most of the Jewish inhabitants of the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, we're talking about 20,000, they moved to Israel. And as of now, there's only 1% left of Jewish people here in the Jewish Autonomous Oblast. There are traces here of Jewish culture. For example, a synagogue, a library, some signs, some statues, and the name, of course, Jewish Autonomous Oblast. But apart of that, there isn't much Jewish of this place. Or has it ever happened? Because around its peak in the mid 1930s, only 32,000 Jews were living here, that made up of 20% of the population. The story of Birabijan is a story of what did not happen. Now, if you want to see more pictures about this fascinating place, you can check out my Instagram at History Hustle. If you'd like to know more about what happened to those who ended up in the Gulag, you can click right here. Also, check me out on Patreon because with your donations, I can travel to fascinating places like these and make videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe.